You're listening to The Pithy Chronicle. History with a bite. I'm Caroline. And I'm Erica. And we bring you history's dirtiest deeds dripping with sarcasm. Are you hungry yet? Welcome back, Pithy listeners. I'm Erica. And I'm Caroline. And today we are talking about two women who are juxtaposed in this battle of were they, weren't they? Were they, weren't they what? I want you, as we are listening to their stories, to ask yourselves, could this person be real? Oh. Or are they a legend? Like a Taylor Swift legend or just like a legend legend? I mean, I'll let you make that determination. Ooh, okay. But before we do that, Caroline, could you do the housekeeping for us? Thank you so much for all of the new likes, subscribes. We've had some lovely reviews. All of those things really help people to find us. And they're free. And they're free. And they help us to get our message out there that history is exciting and sexy and humorous and sometimes feathered. Also, please remember that we do have a Patreon account, which we are currently discussing changing to an Indulgences account, (laughs) because we're on Crusade, with really fun extras as well as early releases. And then we also have a Buy Us a Coffee at buyusacoffee.com forward slash the Pithy Chronicle, where you can throw us a bone, throw us a buck, throw us some caffeine so we can keep the content pithy. And with that, What you got for us today, Erica? Picture this. It's the 11th century, and Florine, the daughter of a Burgundian duke, is on quite the roller coaster ride of life. She's been widowed from a prince of Philippi, betrothed to a Danish prince named Svein, and together they decide to embark on a crusade to Jerusalem with an army of 1,500 Danish knights. Now that's some serious relationship goals, am I right? Absolutely. Together, they're going. But spoiler alert, their romantic quest takes a dark turn. While en route to the Holy Land, they get ambushed by a horde of Turks in Cappadocia. Florine and Svein, although vastly outnumbered, stand their ground and fight valiantly. Picture a scene straight out of an action movie. Arrows flying, swords clashing. It's an epic battle. I see them holding hands right before they enter into battle and then letting go and just having at it. Well, unfortunately, this is not a Hollywood flick, Carolina, and they meet their tragic end right there on the battlefield. But here's the twist. Some versions of the legend say that Florine is pierced by six arrows, but fights valiantly to try to make a run for it on horseback, but gets captured by the Turks and then has a less than happy ending. Oh. Was it a drawn out? I don't think so. It's just death? I think it was more like she had to join a harem. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. But here's the big question. (sighs) Was Florine even a real person or just (laughs) a character straight out of medieval fan fiction? I love it. Medieval fan fiction. Historians are giving her the side eye for a few reasons. First off, she's nowhere to be found in the primary Burgundian sources. It's like she just ghosted all of them. She really only shows up in one chronicle, the works of- Is it Albert of Aachen? It's Albert of Aachen. Oh, we're back! (laughs) Mr. I Hate Women. Yep. And Geese. And Geese. And we support him on half of it. Tell us what Albie had to say. Uh, that was what Albie had to say. Oh, that was it. Yeah, that she died with six arrows piercing her on horseback trying to get to Swain so they could die together. Well, it's nice of him to give her a very brave and sincere moment. I mean, I guess. William of Tyre, one of the big name chroniclers of the Crusades, mentions Swain, but Florine? Nada. It's like she is playing hide-and-seek with the historians. Now, get this. The Chronicle describes Florine as the daughter of the Duke of Burgundy, but the dates are tighter than a suit of armor after a big feast. Ooh! Most (laughs) assume that she was born around 1083, which means she'd be widowed, engaged, and leading an army, and dying, dying in battle, by the tender age of 14. Ooh! I mean... Really? I don't think... That is one 
busy teenager. I know some 14-year-olds. I think some of them could have accomplished all of that because they're so dramatic. But probably not making the best Yeah, I, I, and don't forget, during those times, a teenage monarch was not as rare as a unicorn sighting like they're around. They exist. But usually they had regents because, like you said, teens are dramatic and not known for their world-conquering skills. Also, if you had a regent, wouldn't they be like, mm. If there are any teens listening, we apologize, but you aren't going to conquer the world at 14. No. Spoiler. But if you were a regent, you're not sending an 8th grader off with her boo thing to go get married in Jerusalem. But you might if you were hoping that she just wouldn't come back. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's fair. If I were a scheming regent, I'd be like, sure, go. You just, you just sign this little document saying that if If. you don't survive, I would take over. But like, you go do you, boo. Have a great wedding. Enjoy the honeymoon. Fight on. It's a theory. I like it. It's just it. a thought. But I gotta make you hold your horses. There's another possibility. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> what if Florine <laughs> was illegitimate? Ooh, I like it. <gasps> if she was, that could explain her absence in the Burgundian records. Maybe she was born before her father's marriage and closer to her majority in 1097. Could be. Still young. Mm -hmm. but not the battle-hardened tween we first imagined. And her patron, Swain, wasn't exactly Mm -hmm. your typical prince either. He was an illegitimate son of a Danish king who had more illegitimate children than a medieval version of Jerry Springer. Nice. I mean, not nice. Actually, really bad, but, like, funny. Uh, I mean, he had 21 children. How many were legitimate? Out of 21, I'm going to go with two. One. Oh. And it wasn't Swain. It wasn't Swain. So. Even after a thousand years, that's gross. mm Mm-hmm. Don't even get me started on Florine's first husband, the mysterious Prince of Philippi. We have zero clues about who this guy is or what lands he ruled. It's just like he vanished. Philippi? That d- it sounds Greek? It does sound Greek. I didn't know that the Danes and the Greeks had a lot of interaction at this point. So here's the deal. Technically, he could have just been born in Greece and then gone back to wherever he's from. True. But True. Uh-huh. I guess it's not totally out of the question because the Vikings were certainly in contact with Greek Byzantium. Yeah, yeah. It's not out of the realm of but possibility, but it's not like... It's not next door. It's not your typical thing for an illegitimate daughter. If Actually, a small tiny island might be perfect for an illegitimate daughter. I don't know, that is true. And some monarchs, as a lovely little side note, some monarchs were incredibly attached to their children, legitimate or not. So it is possible that this dad was just like, I need the best option possible for this little girl. I mean, maybe. And then send her off to fight in the Crusades. Anyway, moving on. Here is the ultimate plot twist. Ooh. What if Florine wasn't even connected to Swain and the 1097 events? What if she was on a different adventure with her father in 1102? What? The truth is, we may never know the truth, because her father did go on crusade in 1102. She had a dad this whole time? I was blaming a regent. Had a dad this whole what time? The hell? Had a dad this whole okay. time. It's a medieval mystery that has been debated for centuries. Florina of Burgundy, was she real, a warrior princess, or just a legend? And one thing's for sure, her story has captured the imaginations of many and even found its way into novels like Florine, Princess of Burgundy, A Tale of the First Crusaders in 1855. I do love that she is given some agency in the Victorian era. That's unusual for a woman. It's hyper-romanticized her story. Like much of the Crusades, Mm -hmm. people just thought that this was going to be, frankly, led by God, and therefore they probably thought that a lot of the obstacles that they would face would just kind of vanish from their path. Very much idealized, and the reality sucked. So when reality sucks, what do people do? They disassociate and do things Mm -hmm. that they either wouldn't normally do, their moral compass wouldn't normally allow, or think about people who come back from war and have seen terrible, terrible things. They don't necessarily talk about the terrible, terrible things, but they go on and on about 
the camaraderie, mm-hmm. the, the hijinks. They talk about the things that they enjoyed in this hellish environment. Mm-hmm. And of course, like any good fish tail, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger every time it yeah. gets told. So a thousand years, it makes sense that her experience would have bloated. Ugh, bloated. It's like you with <laughs> widespread the other day. Jesus, Caroline. Oh my God, that was bad. <sighs> All right, are we ready? Are we ready to hear our next lady? Yep, we'll say goodbye to Florine and- Bye, Florine. What's next? Picture it. I'm going. It's the 11th century again, and there is a lady named Ida of Austria, also known as Aitha. Hmm. She's not just any lady. She's known as one of the greatest beauties of her time. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are talking the medieval equivalent of a supermodel here. Well, I'm already jealous. Yeah, I know. Give me some legs like that. But Ida's story takes a seriously unexpected turn when she decides to join the crusade of 1101. The faint-hearted crusade? Ida here seems very (laughs) not strong-hearted. Strong-hearted? I don't know. Sincere. Okay. So fast forward to September of that year, and she's caught up in a harrowing ambush at Heraclea Sebestra by the Sultan, Kilij Arslan I. Ooh. Yep. What happened? Eckhart of Aura, a chronicler of the time, tells us that Ida fought at the battle valiantly, but met her end amidst the chaos. However, here's where things get juicy rumor swirled like a medieval gossip mill, suggesting that maybe Ida didn't actually die. Ooh. Some folks believe she was whisked away to Kilij Arslan's harem, living a very different life. Uh-huh. And if that's not enough, Ooh. there is a wild twist in this tale. Is it a goose? It is not a goose. Later legends, and trust us, medieval legends could get wild claimed that she was the mother of a Muslim hero named Zengi. But (laughs) it's just not possible when you actually look at the numbers. Oh, damn. But we're going to shift the spotlight a bit. Ida's husband, Leopold II of Austria, wasn't your run-of-the-mill medieval noble. He was born in 1050, and he had some serious Bebenberg blood in his veins. Ooh, purple. Yeah, think... Purple blood. If you are a fan of The Last Kingdom, Oh. It's on Netflix. It was a book series. Same family. These people. His ancestors had been ruling the Margravate of Austria for generations. Leopold II took the reins as Margrave upon his father's death in 1075, a spry 25-year-old. And let's just say he had a front row seat to some major historical drama. Ooh. That's right. He was in the thick... (laughs) Of the investiture dispute between Holy Roman Emperor Almost Henry IV and Pope Gregory VII. Oh, dear. (laughs) Girl, I'm bringing it back to Piacenza. Oh, my God. How many times must we talk about Piacenza? (laughs) It literally caused the First Crusade. We will talk about it until we're in the Second Crusade. (laughs) That's fair. Okay. Initially, he was on Henry's side, hanging out at the royal court even after the king's famous walk to Canossa. But the plot thickens. Leopold made a bold switch, all thanks to his wife, Ida, who was a hardcore supporter of Gregory. Yeah. Interesting. It's amazing the change of heart a wife can bring about. Pillow talk. Maybe she had learned a few Kegel exercises from Anna Kamena. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, did Anna? Oh my God. Oh my God. (laughs) She is the queen of all sciences. Obviously. Just she saying. knew. She knew what to do. She knew. So the royal troops, the Holy Roman Emperor's troops, invaded Austria and Leopold found himself on the outs with Henry, who tossed him out like last year's fashion trend. But Bye. Leopold was not one to back down. I like him. He managed to reclaim his position, even though he had a close call at the Battle of Mailburg in 1082. And that was not all. Okay. Leopold and Ida teamed up to promote the Gregorian reforms in their territory, making some serious changes, like no more proprietary churches and marriages of priests. Oh. They were trendsetters of the ecclesiastical world. A supermodel and a trendsetter. Hi, Tyra Banks. <laughs> so they even pitched in for the construction of Milk Abbey. Talk about a power couple. I'm I love loving it. it. 
Now let's not forget about their family. Leopold and Ida were quite the duo. They had a son, Leopold III, who would follow in his father's footsteps as an Austrian margrave. Plus, they had six lovely daughters who oh. ventured into some pretty chic marriages themselves. Adelaide Elizabeth Gerberga. Really? Is what I'm going with They went with, with Adelaide here. Elizabeth and then decided that Gerberga was an equivalent name. That's rude. Ida, Euphemia, and Sophia. All gorgeous names, even if Euphemia is a little weird, but then Gerberga. Bless her heart. Bless her ugly named heart. We need to have a name count because we have Eudokia and Gerberga and Ermengerd. Ermengerd. <laughs> <laughs> I love saying it though. It's so I know. fun. Ermengerd. So, what did these daughters do? They basically got married, forged alliances, and navigated the medieval world of politics and power. Well done, ladies. And that, my friend, is that. The tale of Ida of Austria, the medieval beauty who joined the crusade of 1101, disappeared into the sands of time and left behind a legacy that's still sparking curiosity today. Like mine. In the very short amount of time, we have covered two women of the crusades. They have about the same amount of sources and about the same amount of research, but one is heralded as legendary and one is historical fact. So... Even though neither story is really concrete, they generally have very different receptions. Receptions. Okay, and so Ida is believed to be fact? Fact. Fact. And Florine is is legend. legend. Okay. Well, Mm -hmm. I'm going back to my frustration with researching the nuns of last week and how little information there was and how derogatory the chroniclers were about these women. And so it it doesn't surprise me that the sources are very limited and very, uh, I guess, uh, black and white. There's just no room for the gray of women's ambitions or of their desires or of their reasoning for going on crusade. I do think that the male chroniclers, and that's what we have to work with, made their own judgment of these women, and then that's what they wrote down. Not fact, but judgment, however they decided they felt about these women's roles. It, it sounds to me like they really thought that Ida's role was perhaps more legitimate than Florine's role, and therefore the sources kind of legitimized her more from the outset. And Ida at this point is much older. Much older. So she has a lot more established mm-hmm. history that we can look back to as a legitimate person. Mm-hmm. Whereas it seems like Florine, being illegitimate, being young, she does not... Potentially. Have, potentially, yeah. She does not have the same amount of sources from an earlier part of her life that can help cement or ground the legend or the tale or the story see, or the history. that's the thing. Neither does Ida. I thought Ida with the family, that sounded pretty firm. That's the thing. Their sources are both reputable. It's just that Florine really only has one or two. And so does Ida. They're just more detailed. One has more detail than the other. That's interesting. Overall, I think it's interesting what stories are deemed legitimate or factual versus not. Whether that's a political narrative of whose lives matter and whose don't. Or in literature, what is literature and what is crappy reading. It's how society chooses to legitimize certain things over another. Humans have been doing this since the year 1000 and probably before. Probably before. It's interesting to me that Ida is older and Florine is younger. The sources allow the older person to have a more legitimate reason for doing something that they find to be out of the ordinary. Mm -hmm. She's already fulfilled her role as mother. She's already fulfilled her role as ruler. She's done all the right things, and therefore she gets to have this little moment of religious... Because it is a religious calling, I suppose. But... On the other hand, Florine was young. She hadn't had children. She hadn't done all the necessary things. And she was planning to fight. Especially in light of Barbie that came out this summer. Things that appeal to girls rather than Mm -hmm. women Mm -hmm. are frustrating, silly, vacuous, dilettante 
even look at Taylor Swift, who is a grown woman now, but because mm-hmm. she appeals to a younger demographic, is seen as not a legitimate artist in a lot of ways and in a lot of fields. Or perhaps not a legitimate businesswoman. <laughs> Her tour is absolutely going to make more money than any tour ever. Ever and is single handedly bolstering the economy. Yeah, it is. And people are like, it's just because she's a flighty girl and she's attracting flighty girls. And it's like, no, she knew this was going to make money. She came up with the plan. Do you not think this is all calculated? And I, and that's a positive calculation from and my point of view. She's a mastermind. She's a mastermind. She's a businesswoman. She's figured out what sells. She's highlighting that. And frankly, it's not like she's singing about going out and sleeping with men randomly and killing people. She's talking about friendship bracelets. Yep. I don't know how we got onto this. Well, it's about how younger women or... Women can do amazing things. Things that appeal to girls are deemed illegitimate. It's Mm -hmm. the same Mm -hmm. way that young adult fiction is deemed deemed as a lesser quality of writing because it is not for adults. And what does it appeal Mm -hmm. to? Largely... Their audience is girls. When I was researching, and this is not to say that I think one is fact and one is fiction, that's what stood out to me, the inequality of representation. And that, my friends, is that. I'm Caroline. And I'm Erica, and we are Pithily Wars. This episode is brought to you by The Pithy Chronicle, LLC. The Pithy Chronicle is intended for education, entertainment, and non-commercial purposes. Any views or opinions expressed in this podcast are personal and do not represent those of people, institutions, or organizations that the owner may or may not be associated with in a professional or personal capacity. While we offer lots of sarcasm, this podcast does not offer any advice or services. Listening to this podcast may induce fits of laughter, unexpected distraction, or uncontrollable rage at the subjects. Hopefully not at us. We hope you learned something today. If not, so sorry. Please be advised we are not experts in the following fields. Medical, legal, financial, technological, thermonuclear engineering, submarine warfare, neuroscience, or cat husbandry. Thanks for listening to our little disclaimer. Just covering our history-loving asses. Bye!